Salutations, fellow seekers of knowledge. My name is Laura Swarner. I'm a junior English theater double major with an interest in literally everything from kittens to motorcycles. For my research project, I created some 3D electronic renderings of the Rose Theater, as it might have appeared in 1592. To do this, I learned Cinema 4D, a software used professionally by designers, architects, animators, and motion graphics artists to render and animate 3D models. Computer reconstructions like this are commonly used in archaeology to help visualize buildings that have been lost in history. To create my model, I combined the information that I observed from other individuals' computer-based visualizations as well as physical drawings. I will talk more about that later in the presentation, but for now I will just give you a brief overview of what all went on at the Rose Playhouse. The Rose Playhouse was built in 1587. It was a very successful theater located south of London. Its construction was funded by Philip Henslow, and a lot of what we know about the original theater is found in his financial contracts and from its foundations, which were discovered by archaeologists in 1988. Famous plays such as the Spanish tragedy, Tamburline, Fastus, King Lear, and Titus Andronicus likely were staged there, and it was the first performance venue for the Admiral's men. It is considered by scholars to be extremely small for a public theater. Its original outside diameter was only 72 feet, and the galleries where individuals would cram in to watch performances were only 11 and a half feet across. The yard was a mere 49 feet across, which is almost seven times smaller than the length of a standard football field. The original structure was a polygon of 14 sides, with the hexagonal stage being a total of 16 feet and 5 inches in thrust. According to Julian M. C. Bauscher and Simon Blatherwick's interpretation, the entrance would have been on the south side of the structure and it would have been flat due to its proximity to the Maid Lane sewer. For this reason, a bridge was likely connected to the entrance of the theater. The yard was composed of cinder and nutshell floor. The building had plaster walls and a thatched roof. In 1592, the theater underwent a renovation that appears to have drastically altered its structure. In this phase of construction, the northern half of the theater and the stage were enlarged, bringing the stage to a total depth of 18 feet and 4 inches. According to C. Walter Hodge's estimations, the theater at its longest point would measure 79 feet and 4 inches from outer wall to outer wall. His theoretical ground plan also reveals that the theater was shaped less roundly than before. The yard was increased by 39% in size, and it was made to be more level. It is difficult to estimate what the height of the theater would have been, as only the foundations are left. However, based off the height of the Fortune Theater, which would have likely been similar to the Rose, we can guesstimate that the first floor was approximately 12 feet, the second floor was around 11 feet, and the third floor was about 9 feet. According to Hodge's estimations, it appears that the stage would have been around 4 foot 6 inches off the ground. In my reconstruction, I primarily referred to the plans and models by C. Walter Hodges and Ortelia Interactive Spaces. In building, I followed the structure and dimensions described by Hodges and the wonderful creator of our theater textbook, Oscar Brockett, for structure and dimensions, while I used Ortelia's model as a source of inspiration for the location of inner furnishings, such as benches and objects like windows. This was due to the observation that, to me, Ortelia's layout for the walls of the theater did not seem to represent the archaeological evidence quite as well as Hodge's. As far as the actual process of creating my model, I started with the basic structure and dimensions and built up from there. Most of the details and structures within the model were created using simple shapes that I then used tools within the software to modify into the more complex structures required within the theater. For instance, to create the arch doors on the stage, I started with a simple plane, overlaid a disc, traced half of the disc with a knife tool to create the face of the arc on the face of the plane, and deleted all that was not in the plane, leaving me with the shape that I wanted. To create the flags and the curtain, I selected faces on different points of the plane and simply moved them outwards to give it that curtainy flare. To create the rose image on the flag, I drew a rough image of a rose with a knife tool, selected the faces of the image, and then added the rose color. For the windows, I had to be a little bit creative. I adjusted the beams that I used 
for the outside of the building to the proper size and created the wrought iron in the windows by taking a plane, increasing the number of faces within it to about 100, rotating it 40 degrees, then using the inner extrude tool to create smaller faces around the edge. I went into the plane and deleted the larger phases, leaving diagonal holes in the plane with thick lines. Then I used the knife tool to cut the plane to the shape of the window. I moved both the window frame and the iron structure to the correct place on the wall of the building. Then finally, I used the knife tool again to cut the window out of the building. Part of using a software like Cinema 4D is knowing shortcuts that will make your life easier. A really important part of building my model was the ever so incredible yet simple copy and paste function. This came quite in handy when it came to creating things such as the beams on the outer faces of the building, and even placing the benches within the building. Instead of spending hours building and rebuilding the same structure, I could simply build it once, copy it, and then place it where I wanted in the image. I think by far the most challenging part for me was the roof. For one thing, despite my manipulating the materials to create a nice, thatchy texture, it didn't quite show through in the final product. Additionally, I couldn't figure out a great way to build it and get the overhang since the polygonal structure of the Rose Theater would cause overlapping between separate objects, and attempting to extrude the outer edges of the polygon did not exactly work for me. In the end, I used the same polygon that I used for the floor and beveled it to create the shape of the roof. Overall, I think the process of building the theater was very rewarding. And in the end, I was left with this as my product. Anyways, that's all I have for you right now. This project is brought to you in part by these awesome sources from which I gleaned my research. From the journal, New Issues in the Reconstruction of Shakespeare's Theater, Julian M. C. Boucher and Simon Blatherwick's article, The Structure of the Rose, Andrew Gurr's article, The Rose Repertory, What the Plays Might Tell Us About the Stage, and Walter C. Hodges' article, Reconstructing the Rose. From the publisher Pearson, Oscar G. Brockett, and Franklin J. Hildes, textbook, informative, I mean, oh, so informative textbook, The History of Theater. From the International Journal of Performance Arts and Digital Media, Joe Ann Tompkins and Lazarus Castanis, Staging Supernatural Creatures in a Computer-Based Visualization of London's 16th Century Rose Theatre. Lastly, but not lessly, or leastly, or latestly, Ortelia Interactive Spaces, the Rose Theatre Virtual Environment. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed watching, be sure to catch our next episode of Laura's Research Projects in Theatre History 2. That's all, folks. See you later.